Welcome to the Teachers on Fire podcast, where 21st century educators come to share, learn, and be inspired. We believe in the growth mindset, creativity, communication, critical thinking, collaboration, and strategic uses of education technology. Our mission is to share news and views from teachers who are crushing it in the classroom and making a difference for learners everywhere. I'm your host, Tim Cavey. Let's jump into today's episode. Today, I'm speaking with Paul Stevens Fulbrook, who you might know on Instagram as at Teacher of Psy. Paul is a father of five and head of year seven and eight science at his school. He writes at teacherofsci.com with the mission of supporting teachers' lives through strategy, well-being, and extra income. Hey, I'm listening to that. As a personal observation, I can say that Paul's Instagram stories are hilarious and encouraging. So, Paul, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Are you ready to talk education? You bet, Tim. I'm ready to go. I love it. So, Paul, this is pretty awesome. We're, we're coming to each other across the Atlantic and, and really across, I guess it depends which way around the planet we want to go, but you're, you're coming to, I was going to say North America, but I guess we... We could cross Asia as well. I don't know actually which Look, is whatever way you want to go. We can go anywhere <laughs> you like. Whatever way we want to go. So you're coming to us from the UK. So tell us about your context first. Set it up for us. Where are you in education? What are you involved in right now? Well, I uh, live in Brighton in the UK. It's on the south coast. And I work in a large high school called Stenning Grammar School. Um, it's got about 2,000 students, give or take, uh, based on... Th- over three separate sites, um, two of those are the year seven or year seven and eight or grade seven and eight sites, and they're the ones I work at, and I run the science for those ones. Uh, the school itself has quite a large catchment area. It brings in kids from local towns and villages, but it also has this international boarding, um, a lot of international boarding students that come to us from all over the world. Okay. Very cool. So kind of an international student body, is that right? Yeah, mainly from the UK and in the local area, but from as far as the Caribbean and Africa. Oh, fascinating. So Paul, take us to a low moment, first of all, that you faced in your teaching or education career, and then walk us through that bit of adversity. How did you get through it? Yeah, well, I think we can, uh, we can title this answer, be careful who you take your advice from. Okay. Uh, so in my first school, um, fresh out of teacher training, I, I, I looked to all the people, all the teachers who immediately I saw that were um, kind of the go-to people in the school. And I asked some of those more ambitious teachers how I should settle in, what I should do, give me some advice on, on bonding with the students I had straight away. And in hindsight, some of the advice I was given was really quite bad. It was stuff like uh, be, be stern and, and don't smile and, and don't try and be their friend for a while. Build your relationship that way. And it really didn't work. I really didn't bond with any of the kids. Um, and it took a, quite a while to come back from. And so I, I, I looked at some of the other teachers around the school and thought, well, who doesn't say a lot? Who isn't this, these ambitious go-getting teachers? Let's talk to them. And I spoke to a couple of more quieter teachers and they, would, they just said, well, we've seen you in the class and this, you in the class is not the same as you in the staff room. So be that person, be yourself, go out there and be funny, be stupid, jump around in front of the kids, they'll love it. Mm-hmm. And I had to wait till the next next year to really get into that. But yeah, looking back on it, it was, it was a case of be yourself. And what was a massive low point to start with really turned into the biggest learning curve and the biggest positive outcome I could come I could get from it. I love your story, Paul. And, you know, knowing you and like I said, watching a little bit of your work on Instagram, I can see that profound sense of humor that you've got. And it just makes me sad to think about that sort of locked away as as you embarked on this on this teaching journey. But I'm so glad that you got some better advice and you turned things around. And, And I'm sure you found a lot of just freedom and joy in the moment, right? When you were free to sort of release yourself. Yeah, it just suddenly I went from being a teacher that was really struggling to one that was actually enjoying going to work. And now whenever I whenever I speak to new teachers coming into the school, the first thing I tell them is, be yourself. Just be who you are. If, if you're bonkers, fine, do it. If you're <laughs> strict, fine, be do. Just be yourself, because the kids will see through any false images you put out and tear through you. So, 
be yourself. That's that's the best bit of advice ever for a teacher. Paul, your stated mission on your blog is supporting teachers' lives through strategy, well-being, and extra income. That's a, that's a unique but intriguing mission. So tell us, how do you aim to help teachers be better holistically and financially? Okay, well, I, we, the way I see it, most teachers around the world, there are some excellent teachers who don't struggle but most of us teachers struggle a little bit with either finances or health or, or fitting everything into the working day I know that's that's definitely where I am um, so I, when I started the blog I realized very early on that this was an opportunity to do something a little bit more than just have a blog and write about my day uh, which is what it was going to be to start with so I, I looked around a lot of other blogs a lot of edu- other education blogs and, and most not all uh, there are some really great ones out there but a lot of education blogs <clears throat> are quite dry and hard to digest there's lots of pedagogical um, terminology on there which after a hard day is tricky to to to, to eat <laughs> to get down um so i wanted to make something that was quite easy to digest uh, the idea was similar to a conversation you'd have with colleagues in a pub after work on a friday so with those three topics, um, strategy for teaching, extra income and health, just want to give real world, actual, easy to implement stuff that teachers can just take on board and, and run with. So that, I, I get a lot of people writing for the blog and a lot of people asking to write for the blog, but I really need to focus on making sure whatever goes out there is going to be useful and useful quickly, not something that takes lots of planning to an extra work for the teachers, something they can read and go out there and do. That's fantastic, Paul. You know, I was talking recently with another educator about how all of the reading that we do through our undergrad and, and you know, through our university days, most of it is pretty dry stuff. Like you said, it's not the kind of reading that we tend to pick up and you know, take a lot from directly into the classroom. And I'm so thankful for the literature that is coming out both in in blogs, blogs like yours, and in books from, you know, I think of Dave Burgess Consulting and the Teach Like a Pirate series and so many other books that are really writing for teachers exactly where they are. So again, your blog is at teachers or sorry, teacherofsci.com. That's S-C-I.com. And I love those three areas that you're addressing. And I think you're right. Those are pretty universal needs, aren't they, for most teachers today? Yeah, they definitely are. Certainly everyone I speak to, they're the three things that they need help with. Paul, tell us about what excites you about education today. You're kind of an excitable guy. So <laughs> where's your where where's your passion? And obviously, you know, all of your handles and your your branding is all about SCI, meaning science, that's kind of your wheelhouse. But but what is it that excites you about education today? Where's your main passion? Um, my main passion is digital tech, tech in the classroom and how it can really, really start to um, engage students on, on a level that we've not seen before. I mean, we've had a few uh, apps and bits and pieces in the past, but this year and for the last couple of years, it's come on leaps and bounds. It's now gone from a little tool that might help us record data to now something where you can you can just live in the classroom in this totally different environment um, and the reason that is such a big thing to me is because my my biggest passion in the classroom is engagement um, that's my number one tool we, we we often tell kids off and think about them you're always on your phone you're always i know i'm always telling my kids they're on their phone too much or on their tablet too much but that's the world they live in the kids that are at school today aren't someone who has a phone for just sending a text and making calls their entire world is in those devices and the days of pens and paper are really on their way out so our job as teachers isn't to break them out of their world and put them in our world of pens and paper and writing our our job as teachers is to adapt how we do the job and how we adapt is to start to live in their world and using some of these amazing apps that are out there at the moment right um can only build engagement further and further and further and if we don't if teachers don't start uh, um, further and stick with what the kids are doing we'll end up becoming out of touch and when and then you let, end up at risk being the boring teacher and no one wants that <laughs> no one wants. paul outside of education let's take it outside of the classroom if we can we can't always i guess but what's another area of passion and learning for you um so I, i'm an all-in kind of guy if i'm doing something i i, I want to do it all the time um my wife tells me off for that um but at the moment at the moment it's the blog is the main passion uh but apart from that um i like to run 
I don't run as much as I should, but um, my wife goes out running a huge amount of time per week, but we do park run on a Saturday together. That's um, in a local park. We go there at nine o'clock every Saturday morning and run for 5K, which is, I think, 3.1 miles, which is great. It really sets you up for the weekend. So I'm really into that. I'm going to try and start running a little bit more. So that's a bit of a passion. Um, apart from that, uh, I love cooking. When I first left school, I trained as a chef. So I like to cook and bake cakes with the kids and just generally spending quality time with the family. One thing I have learned is you've got to, you've got to take time for yourself and not, it can't all be about teaching, teaching, teaching. You've got to close the books at some point. Yeah, I, I, I can't believe that I've been teaching as long as I have. I'm now in my 18th year, but I think if there's one thing I can pass on just in terms of, you know, pulling back, looking at the big picture as an educator, I 100% agree, Paul. I think we have to stay connected with family and with our personal passions outside of the classroom. We've got to have other things going on that light our fire and just make us into better educators right well they have it's life experience really helps you in the classroom um without that you all you've got is the books and you need a bit more than that the uh, the cooking angle paul makes a lot of sense to me because i feel like every science teacher must look at the kitchen as your own personal laboratory right uh a little bit <laughs> but because I, I trained as a chef to start with um I, oh, I, I, yeah when i first left I, I i trained trained as a chef and that was great Oh, wow. I, love it. I decided that... not to be a chef because you know you're working when everyone else is having fun um right but no I, I i'm awful at art i can't my my drawing ability stopped and peaked at drawing stick men the only thing i can do well artistically is cooking that's why that's my one art food is my art so uh, paul we've been talking about balance and you know you've been publishing to the blog you're a teacher you're a father of five that's amazing so share about a personal habit you mentioned the running but is there something else that contributes to your success um well there's in the school i'm at the moment there is a quote on one of the doors that i walk past probably six what feels like six million times a day and it's a, an arabic proverb that says, says seek education from cradle to grave and that really is my my mantra Everything I do, I'm trying to learn more from, whether it's at school or with the blog or cooking or anything in life. You, I, I just try and learn every day from everything. Paul, we're going to move into some rapid fire recommendations here. So we'll start at Twitter, every educator's base for a solid PLN. So tell us about someone we should be following on Twitter and explain why. Okay, I am so late to Twitter, it's embarrassing. <laughs> um, so I haven't, been, I haven't been on Twitter very long, but one of the guys that I do follow who I've, I've on a few um, Facebook groups and other things with is a guy called Lee Parkinson. He is a, a primary teacher and blogger and author and lots of other things. He's a teacher from, I think he's in Manchester in the UK, so in the North UK. And he's got some real fun stuff and real, really good stuff on Twitter and everywhere, I think. But he's under Miss... At, ICT underscore Mr. P. But he's, he's really good to follow. Very, very cool. And as we continue, I'll make sure to get all of these notes and links up on teachersonfire.net. So check that out to make sure you get a hold of the picks that Paul's dropping here. Next, Paul, point us to an ed tech tool that you currently love using in your classroom or your day to day work. Okay. Um, it's very difficult for me to. <laughs> to narrow these down because I like so many but my school is actually a Google school we're, we are an affiliated Google school so we use Google Classroom uh, for everything um, from setting home learning to uh, even staff, appraise, staff appraisal um, so Google Classroom is great but apart from that um, there's one that I'm really excited to start using it's called Classcraft I've just started using it with my own tutor group and it is it's it's an absolute nerd fest it's in the vein of world of warcraft <clears throat> and it, you assign characters to each of your students in the class and they earn, earn health points uh oh, sorry they lose health points if they've been done something which requires a behavior issue and they gain xp if they've done something good and it's just a really fun way of engaging the class but classcraft is fantastic i'm i'm really hyped to be using it this year but I've got to stop talking about it because otherwise I'll just talk about it for hours. <laughs> no, I, I love that. And, and I haven't gotten into gamifying my classroom enough. So I appreciate that recommendation. 
thank you for that. And then, Paul, tell us about a book, maybe one that you read over the summer and you thoroughly enjoyed, or or maybe one you've been into lately, and tell us why you recommend it. Okay, so I've got kind of two. There's Unlocking Excellence, a book by another teacher called Jared, Jared Dumas. I think you had him on here before. Um, his book is yeah, absolutely. Um, his book's fantastic. It's just a short read. It's really fast and punchy, but it's about how to take your teaching up to the next level. Uh, it's really good. I like it. Um, but then anything by Terry Pratchett. <laughs> I like if I'm reading for for pleasure. It's I really enjoy reading Terry Pratchett's books because they just take you away and you can't even think about anything else. You're so into the story. <laughs> so he writes fiction. Yeah, they're fiction. They're, kind of fantasy fiction but they're based the the tropes and themes throughout the books are based on real world stuff but they are completely not of this world <laughs> they're, they're fantastic all right very cool i always need to add a little more fiction to my reading lineup i find i'm such a non-fiction nerd that uh, it, it actually takes a little bit of discipline but once i get into a good fiction title it's it's always rewarding it's another one of those things isn't it once you start reading a good fiction book then you're not thinking about the stresses of everyday life once you're lost in a book. So that's why I try I try not to read too much teaching stuff in my home time. <laughs> Fair enough. And then uh, two more questions, Paul, or, or I guess three, actually. Are you a podcast listener? And if so, recommend a podcast that maybe as a commuter we should add to our podcast deck. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I do listen to a lot of podcasts, um, but apart from this one, Yay. I don't listen to any, I don't listen to any education podcast. This is this is the only one I listen to. Um, little plug for you there, but it's a fan. It is really good. Thanks so much. Um, my podcast time is for me to either relax on the way home from work or just take myself away a little bit. Um, my Monday morning drive to work is always listening to the latest episode of No Such Thing as a Fish. Okay. Which is, <laughs> so I don't know whether you have over there a TV show called QI. It's a, uh, it's a TV show no. that it's, QI stands for quite interesting. So it's all about a sort of celebrity quiz about f different bonkers facts. Um, but the guys who do the research for that have their own podcast called No Such Thing as a Fish. There's four of them and they each come on for their episode and tell you about tell you one fact and then they have a discussion about it but they're all comedians and, and incredibly funny people it's a good way to get to work on a Monday <laughs> okay and then Paul I don't know how much you use YouTube in your classroom in your personal practice but is there a channel that we need to subscribe to you know a lot of teachers are still a little late to the YouTube game right they're they're just sort of using it on the basis of of searching individual topics, but in terms of starting to build a, a bank of subscriptions, is there a channel that you would recommend? Um, a channel I use a lot in my classroom is, is SciShow. Um, it's run by a guy called Hank Green. Um, he talks at a million miles an hour, so I, I, I think I'd get on with him well. But he's got some great, his, hundreds of great science videos on there. Um, not just good for science lessons, but there's, there's some really interesting stuff on there to play for kids. Quite often I, I we get to the end of the lesson and maybe I've got five minutes. So I'll just read out three titles and they get uh, they can choose from them and we'll just watch one of those for fun. Um, but that's really good. Uh, but from an education perspective, there's a channel called Four Teachers, F-O-R Teachers, Four Teachers, rung by two hideously good-looking young British primary school teachers. Um, they're British primary school teachers, but they work in Hong Kong, I think. Um, they've got lots of great videos on lots of education topics, um, stuff from classroom management to, I think, Katie, one of the, one of the two uh, YouTubers on there, did a series on um, fashion for the classroom or something like that. It was dresses, so I, I, I keep my dress wearing for the weekend, so <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't watch that one. All right. Well, I, I love, I don't know if that's a Britishism or if that's just you, but I, I love the hideously good looking. So I'm curious now. To, <laughs> get a, get it's a, a, guy, a, guy, a guy called Ryan and a girl called Katie and okay. they're, they're, they're far too good looking to be on TV. On <laughs> right. And then if I could, if I can make a quick mention about SciShow. So uh, the, I'm familiar with the Crash Course channel and I think that's uh, Hank's brother, John who runs the crash course videos. And so that's, I, I'm more of a science or pardon me, I'm more of a social studies teacher and uh, that's a phenomenal channel. So if SciShow is anything like it, then it's definitely one to add to the list as well. Yeah. I'll check that one out. That, that's, that seems good. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. And then uh, Paul, I don't know if you're a Netflixer or how you do your entertainment viewing, but if you are at the end of the day, you've made your 
lesson plans, you've written a blog post, all you've got energy left for is just settling into the couch. What are you watching these days? <laughs> um, well, I live in a house with four of my children and my wife, so I don't get control of the TV very often. Um, okay. I was thinking about saying that my wife and I are just about to start watching a, t a show called Santa Clarita, <clears throat> Santa Clarita Diet. Uh, it's a horror comedy star, uh, horror, horror comedy show starring Drew Barrymore. Um, but I've just been informed about an hour ago that my wife has finished watching that and all two seasons <laughs> of it. So I'm not watching that anymore. So once they're all in bed and I get control, I like to watch. Yeah. Um, it's uh, really trashy stuff. Well, Big Bang Theory, which isn't okay. trashy, that's great. Yeah. But stuff like survival shows like Bear Grylls, uh, yeah. Born Survivor, Deadliest Catch, and food shows like Man vs. Food, just stuff I don't have to think about. Yeah. But I can, I can stay up way too late watching Man vs. Food. You know, when, when you talk over here in North America about a really trashy show, I think some people might get the idea that there's some kind of adult content, but you're, you just mean this is, <laughs> you just mean this is like, this yeah, no, no, show. not like that. <laughs> yeah. Just, just, uh, yeah. Shows you don't have to think about stuff. Gotcha. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Not nothing dodgy. <laughs> of course. Make that clear there to all go. of your listeners. I do not watch dodgy things when my wife is in bed. <laughs> Paul, man, you are a blast and I really appreciate your insights. I love that accent. You know, as an educator, that just works, man. So this has been so much fun. Thank you for sharing your time. What are the best ways for the listener, to, the listeners, sorry, to follow you and get to know your content a little better? All right, well, thank you very much for having me on it, Tim. It's been great. I've really enjoyed it. I was a little bit nervous to start with, but we're fine now. Okay. Um, on Twitter, it's at Teacher of Psy One. Someone, as I said, I was late to Twitter, so someone pinched my name. So Teacher of Psy, and then number one. Um, the website is teacherofpsy.com. I'm on Pinterest at Teacher of Psy, Instagram at Teacher of Psy, and Facebook at Teacher of Psy. So if I search for Teacher of Psy, I'm bound to pop up somewhere. Yeah, we'll find you at Teacher of Psy. Got it. Yeah, and that's some that's some consistent branding. So easy enough and. I've got to say, on Instagram, you've got to check Paul out. 10,000 followers. Can't be wrong. From this side of the Atlantic, have a good night and enjoy the rest of this school year. Yeah, thank you very much. Keep doing what you're doing. It's great. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Teachers on Fire, where teachers come to share, learn, and be inspired. Please subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review on iTunes, and follow us on Twitter at Teachers on Fire. I'm your host, Tim Cavey, saying goodbye for now, and we'll catch you next time right here on the Teachers on Fire podcast.